So tell me, Kyle, why is it, given the strengthening we've seen in the Chinese yuan, the RMB if you prefer, mm -hmm. the strength she seems to have going into the National Party Congress in a couple of weeks, that you still believe as strongly as ever that, war, that the Chinese banking system is going to collapse? And again, you know, collapse is a strong word. What what I think is we're going to have a we're going to have a loss cycle that's going to cause recapitalizations of their banks. And so when I think when people think about collapse, you think about Lehman, right? And we think about where do we put our money in? The world's coming to an end. I don't think the world's going to come to an end. I think the Chinese authorities are going to recap their banks, and I think they're going to be forced to. During the Asian financial crisis, uh, call it '98 to 2001, China recapped its banking system. It had to. Right. Interestingly enough, didn't have a sovereign, uh, never had a sovereign downgrade. Right, it hasn't had one in 30 years. So during their last banking crisis, there was no sovereign downgrade. Uh, we've had a couple of sovereign downgrades recently, uh, but during the during their last crisis, it cost them 30 percent of their GDP to recap their banks. That's how much they had to invest in their banks to recap them. I think that's about what it's going to cost this time. Uh, and so. 30% of Chinese GDP, Chinese GDP is almost $12 trillion. You're talking about like $3.5 trillion. And again- That's going to come out of the economy? It's going to have to get put into the banks, right? They're going to have to print that many RMB in dollar terms to put into the banks to recap their system. Just to stabilize. Because they have $40 trillion worth of assets. They only have $2 trillion of equity. Think about that, right? $40 trillion of assets. You only have to lose 5% of your assets to wipe out your entire system. Is that going to happen? Of course that's going to happen. Right? Chinese bank non-forming loans in 2001 were a third of their system. So when you just orders a magnitude, is that going to happen? Of course it's going to happen. And you feel as certain about this today as you did when you first put on this trade back in the middle of 2015? Yeah. I mean, go talk to, any, talk to anyone that has been a former IMF chief economist. Talk to anyone that studied credit systems and ask them off the record. They won't go on the record. Ask them off the record if China's gonna have a, an NPL crisis. I guarantee you get unanimity in, their answer, in your answer. But the question is, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Well, China will recap their banks. They'll slash their triple R, which they cut last week, another 150 basis points, their reserve requirement. They'll cut, they'll slash their triple R, they'll have to print a whole bunch of RMB, they'll do it, right? It's not the end of the world, and none of our banks are connected to theirs. So it's not this global collapse that went on in the It's not going to metastasize globally. No, it, it, won't be, it won't be a cancer in the financial system of the globe. It'll just be a problem in China that will also be problem, problematic for Asia for a short period of time. Why aren't more people coming around to this point of view? Because the argument you make is a strong one. It's very persuasive. But at the same time, more and more people whom I talk to seems to be gaining confidence in China, not losing confidence in China. Yeah, I think, I think that number one's availability heuristic and, and, and you believe what the government says. Uh, and you want to believe because the majority of everyone in the world is long everything, right? Whether you're a long-term investor or short-term investor, the majority of everyone, like the odds on bet is long. They're all long, long biased. Massively long biased and massively uh, long in their investments. And, if you're a pension fund or an endowment and you have money allocated to China, this is the last thing you want to hear, right? And so there's this, there's this kind of psychological bias that this is why very few people get crises right. Because if all you're doing is waiting for a crisis your whole life, you're, you're swimming against the swimming upstream and it gets tiring. Uh, but I think in this case, um, it doesn't, doesn't really behoove anyone who's long China to, to not believe. But look, look at the Chinese government's most recent proclamation this year uh, about the, Li the, prov the province of Liaoning. Uh, Liaoning's like, call it a, as big as Texas or California is to China. And they admitted that from 2011 through the end of 2014, so for the, for the better part of five or six years, they overstated their GDP by 20%. 20%, not two, but 20. And what did they... If, if Texas or California overstated their contribution to U.S. GDP for five years by 20 percent, what would the next thing, uh, what would the, in, the, in the logic of your mind or in economic logic, what would they have to do next? Well, they'd have to restate the national GDP accounts. But what did China do? They just adjusted the, the GDP deflated by 21 percent, never changed the, the national number because they didn't want to. So there are things like China just makes things up because it suits them. 
Do you think, as a Western investor or a Western creditor, it, when things go wrong, how well do you think you're going to do in China, in the Chinese courts? You're not going to do very well. What precipitates the crisis, if you will? You know, you've oh, something like uh, overcapacity industries. You know, they decided a year ago, a year and a year and a half ago, that they're going to go from their old export-based manufacturing-centric uh, economy to the new economy of, of internal consumption and, and services. Well, the problem with that is all of the bank loans and all their bank assets are lent to the old economy, not the new economy. So they're already going through this, Eric, they're just hiding it. And you can only hide this for so long before you have to recap your banks. And the answer is when this tree falls in the wood, or the question is when the, tree, this, when the Chinese tree falls in the wood, will anyone hear it? And the, the, the economic 101 answer is eventually they will because there is one arbiter of this whole situation and it's the exchange rate of their currency vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, not how, just the dollar. How long does it take? I mean, we, look, early, early equals wrong uh, in market uh, parlance, but I think uh, when you look at uh, what we expect to happen, it's gonna happen in the next 18 months has to. And we think that the anomaly has been, there's been a, a, think about what's happened in China. In November of last year, when the currency was c becoming unhinged, and Dailan Wanda and uh, HNA and Bombay. all of the voracious acquirers of any Western asset that, that was nailed down, at extremely low cap rates, by the way, uh, that, that's what was happening. The smart people were trying to get their money out of China. Uh, and then China put a stop to China that. China said no more. They basically turned off. Do you think uh, that's a sign as well? Oh, for sure it's a sign. It was a panic. They took all multinational corporations. They won't let multinational corporations get their money out. They just stopped it. So they, and then they clamped down on individuals. As of September 3rd, they announced that any, tran any transaction over 1,000 RMB of a Chinese national either pulling cash out or spending it abroad is going to receive scrutiny, and that file is going to have to be sent from the banks to the uh, safe currency administrator once a week. Imagine how big that file is, transactions of, what, $150 or greater? Like, they've put a noose around capital flows. But when you have an economy going from developed, or developed, sorry, developing to developed, and you're pulling all these people out of abject poverty into the, call it middle class, and even creating well, the wealthy, what happens? Well, they start traveling abroad and investing abroad. So if you look at the services deficit, the travel services deficit in China, this is their numbers, not mine. It's 30, it's reached 30 billion a month of negative flows. It's only gonna grow from here on out. As you pointed out, you were early to this trade, mm. middle of 2015. If it's going to take another 18 months or somewhere in that time frame mm -hmm. for it to work out for you, right? is that, A, can you afford to wait? And B, is that consistent with what you saw at the beginning, or have, have, you, have you had to push out uh, your expectations? That's a good, it's a good question. Uh, it worked in 15, it worked in 16, in, in 16, it hasn't worked in 17. It wasn't a crisis in 15 and 16, it was a depreciation of, of the RMB. Right, but it, it, turned into, it turned into pretty much of a crisis in November of 2016. The Chinese government had to do things that were completely abnormal. Right. Imagine, imagine an economy that claims to be the, the first or second largest economy in the world. They were just added to the IMF SDR basket. They are supposedly one of the largest economic and developed countries in the world, and yet they have extreme and severe capital controls imposed. They can move overnight interest rates three to 500 basis points. They're still a backwater. They're still an emerging economy that has huge problems, and yet everyone gives them credit for being a, a developed Well, the skeptics, country. again, they're out there, would say, they just proved in November of 2016 that yes, those measures were extreme, but they stabilized the situation. They can do that. They they have they have the levers. They've got the dials. Okay, so I'll, we'll we'll finish this conversation with one quote, and it's a quote from a from a uh, a friend of mine who used to be one of my partners at Heyman. He said that uh, if command and control economies worked, we'd all be speaking Russian today. Well, we won't finish it on that point, although that's a very good <laughs> quote. Let's go back to the question of whether you've had to push out your expectations. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the National Party Congress and the extreme measures that China uh, uh, implemented in Q4 of 2016 have pushed us out um, 18 months. From where you initially thought it would work out. Yeah. So it would be working out now, effectively. Yes, that's correct.
and what kind of a risk do you think there is that they'll do something like that again and you'll have to push your, your expectations that much further? Oh, I mean, the, the God only knows, right? But then you have this scenario in North Korea that could become a real flashpoint globally that could be problematic for their economy. And so they're all kind, no one ever knows what one factor sets something off, um, and nor do I, but there's, there's, there's just, they've, You've gone to these shows where there are people that uh, spin plates on uh, on sticks, and they hold like uh, ten of them somehow. China's got a lot of plate spinning, and if one plate drops, they all drop. And so uh, I think that there's a very high likelihood of the plates uh, dropping. Because of North Korea, or for any other reason? I mean, economic gravity is going to cause some of them to fall, and North Korea could cause one of them to fall, and all of them to come down. There's so many things that could go on. Uh, that have non-zero probabilities, and some are some are actually more probable than not. I.e., their their uh, their banking system itself. Uh, so it's it's just something that we think is is I I, ha I just think it's somewhat of a certainty. I just don't know when.